welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm your host, Daniel Davis. Many of us sometimes find ourselves wondering in that vast open world where we find that things just aren't working out for us. Sometimes we just kind of figure, well, it's just fate or just circumstances, certain things like that that are keeping us from moving forward in our lives. Very few of us, though, ever stop to think for a moment that maybe it's something in our past, a loss that we have suffered that is probably preventing us from moving forward in the first place. Joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today is co-author of a wonderful book simply titled The Grief Recovery Handbook. and This is the 20th anniversary expanded edition Our guest today is one of the founders of the Grief Recovery Institute, and he's also co-author of When Children Grieve. And I'd like to welcome to our program today our guest, Russell Friedman. And Russell, thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. Hi, Daniel. My absolute pleasure. You know, i got to tell you, for people out there, this is actually a more popular book than I would have ever imagined the first time we had you on our program here. It seems there are a lot of people who really know the work that the both uh, you, John W. James, and that you have been doing over the last 30 years. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> what is it we do? Yeah. Yeah. A perfect question. In simplest terms, we help people deal with death and divorce and all other of the 41 other losses, in addition to death and divorce, all of which conspire to keep us often reliving the past in a negative way, paralyze us, cause us to sabotage current and future relationships because of our our ties, our negative ties to the past. And also, sometimes we lose the ability to have fond memories of relationships from the past because of the unresolved grief that's tied to it and traps us. So that's what I do. And people ask me, what I, by the way, people always ask me, isn't it depressing what you do talking about grief? And I say, no, uh, almost without exception, when I've talked to someone, whether it's out walking with my dog or here on the phone with you or uh, in delivering lectures to thousands of people, almost inevitably the people after I talk with them or while we're talking, they feel some hope that recovery is possible. They have an idea that someone listened to them and heard them. So I'm the most uplifted person I know because I get to do this every day. And, you know, when I help people, I get to feel best of all. And so kind of a neat thing, and it's opposite of what anyone thinks, that I would feel bad. No, I feel good most all the time. Yeah, Russell, it's so true. And when people get the opportunity to pick up the Grief Recovery Handbook, you begin to realize so many dynamics when it comes to loss and how we cope with it, how our society presents ways that they believe we should be coping with it. And you think to yourself that, you know, most of us actually live in our past, which prevents us from having a brighter future in some ways, and actually being in the moment to do something about that. What makes this work so dynamic that you've noticed uh, as you work with people? It, it, it's it's interesting. The hardest part about everything we do is that it's too easy. My job <laughs> is that true. It's, it's probably Welcome true about America, everything. America, the more complicated it is, the more efficient it must be, right? And, I, and my golf teacher would agree because my complicated swing. He's been trying to get me to simplify. Just take it back and hit it, you know. <laughs> but but it's true that the and the biggest complication of all of it is this. The vast the grief is a normal and natural reaction to loss of any kind. You don't really need to be trained. You watch a baby, you watch an infant, they know how to be sad without being taught. They know how to be happy without being taught. But after a while, when they get older, we start teaching them right away that they shouldn't feel bad, and we therefore complicate that which would be simple. And then it winds up that people like John and I spend our adult lives trying to shift people about 14 inches from their head to their heart because the vast majority of incorrect information that we all get tends to push us into our intellect when our intellect is not the problem. I have talked to 100,000 grieving people, literally. I mean, that's a huge number. I've been doing this for 22 years. Mm -hmm. I have never had anyone call this phone number here at the Grief Recovery Institute with a broken head. They call with a broken heart, and my job is to help shift them to that arena, which is the one I can help them in. It, otherwise, it's kind of like shopping for milk in a hardware store. If, if I, if you, and most times when people say they don't feel good, people respond intellectually to that rather than emotionally. So if you're sad because someone important to you died and they say, well, don't feel bad, she's in a better place. Well, maybe it's intellectually accurate. 
that the person who died is in a better place. Let's hope it is true. They're not in pain anymore, and maybe they're in a wonderful place. But the other truth is that the grieving person is not in a better place. The grieving person is an emotionally sad, confused, lost place. So here we take, try to give them an intellectually accurate idea, if it's true, and then have that shift them away from their broken heart. And interesting enough, this morning, just before I got on the phone with you, I got a call from a grieving pet owner who was devastated. Her dog, her best pal of 13 years, died last night. And I kept saying to her, my opening line to her was, I imagine your heart is broken in a trillion pieces. And she started crying. And every time she'd go into her head and try to have some intellectual reason why she shouldn't feel bad, I just would say, gee, I still imagine your heart is broken. And I would keep bringing her back to the truth and the place that I could help her from. Because intellectually, she didn't need my help. Emotionally, she did. And so that's what I helped her with. You know, and that's so true that uh, in our society, and it's everywhere, I remember the first time when we uh, approached this particular subject, I began to see what you would call the myths, if you were, and you started bringing up the first one, oh, don't worry about it, she's in a better place. Right. Oh, just move on and forget about it. You see it in movies, you see it, hear it. It's everywhere. Why do we buy into this intellectual idea of moving beyond grief rather than allowing our heart to open up and healing to really begin? Because we are taught from our earliest conscious ages to do that. And that's the trap. The people we should trust the most, our parents and then our, our clergy, our guardians, our teachers, our coaches, they all teach us the wrong stuff. Why? Because they got the wrong stuff. And let's put a face on this so it's not just language. Uh, you got a little girl. It could be a girl or a boy. you got a little girl who's four years old, and she comes home from preschool with big tears in her eyes. And the mommy or daddy correctly says, what happened, honey? And the trusting child tells her parents, "With she goes, the other little girls were mean to me. Mm -hmm. At which point, the incorrect parent who loves their child but doesn't know how to do this says, quote, don't feel bad, honey. Here, have a cookie. You'll feel better. Now, Here's a question. Does a cookie make the child feel better, or does it make the child feel different? And there's only one correct answer, and the answer is different. Because let's face it, if you put some sugar in my body or your body or a little kid's body, it's going to alter you. You're going to get a little bounce it's like you and I drinking coffee or something. And what happens is the parent hasn't addressed the emotional issue that was brought forward and basically teaches the child to medicate her feelings with a substance. My gosh, where have I heard of that so that we have a country, and I know you've heard the stats, a couple of years ago, the Centers for Disease Control said that there were 400,000 obesity-related deaths each year in the United States of America. They've since modified the number, say, now maybe it's 200,000. That's still a, a huge number. And we have a pandemic of alcohol and drug abuse where you have that same little girl at age four, 10 years later, She's had her first romantic breakup, and she's walking across the playground with her shoulders drooped. And someone says, here, don't feel bad. Try this. You'll feel better. And she gets handed a marijuana or a beer or some other substance. Now, where did she learn to use substances to medicate or modify her feelings? From her own mommy and daddy, who would never have willingly or willfully taught their child to cover up feelings, but that's exactly what they did. So when I get a chance to talk on the radio like this to millions of people, we have millions of listeners, right? Millions of people have to hear that that's a terrible message to teach the child to modify your feelings with substance because later you're going to teach them not to do drugs and alcohol and they're going to go, wait a minute, you taught me to eat cookies and you taught me to put sugar in my body and you never talked to me about my feelings. So the don't feel bad, which is the number one myth in the, of our six we identify, is taught to three and four and five year olds. And something, this is scary, by the time a child in our society is 15 years old, they've had more than 25,000 inputs that suggest A, they shouldn't feel bad in the first place, and B, if they do, they should do it alone. As in, if you're going to cry, go to your room, or knock off that crying, or I'll give you a reason to cry. So all <laughs> of this happens real early right. before we have the ability to go, gee, does that make sense? Is this correct? I mean, how would you argue with a parent who says, don't feel bad here for cooking, and say, excuse me, mother, I think you should be talking to my feelings here, not to putting food in me. The kid's not going to do that. Mm -hmm. So he or she accepts that as a truth from a high authority source, mom or dad, 
and now they have a lifetime. And now you get to be 25, and your your grandma dies, or or your your dog dies, or you have a romantic breakup, and all you're left you're left with don't feel bad. When feeling bad is the most normal, natural, logical, emotional reaction to loss of any kind. As feeling good is the correct response to good news, feeling bad is the correct response to sad news. So we take the normal out of the equation, put an abnormal idea in, and say, here, go live your life with, you know, with no arms and no, no emotional arms or legs to support you. I never said that, but that's a good one. No emotional arms or legs to support you. That's a good one. <laughs> I'm, I'm making a note here, Daniel. See what grief recovery can do for someone? You could become yes. definitely Well, it will be my next article. It will be emotional <laughs> arms and legs. Uh -huh. You know, uh, the thing is, too, is when people are allowed to grieve appropriately, you know, the first thing we have to take a look at is time. You know, how long does it usually take before a person really feels healed from a loss, regardless of what the loss is, what are some really good steps that you uh, take, especially at the Grief Recovery Institute, that help people do that, and what types of transformations do you typically see? I know that's kind of a triple-loaded question yep. there, but it seems to be the right process and the best way I knew how to ask it. Well, okay, and what I'm going to do is scale it back to part one of the tri triple part because we need to do this. And what you've done is fallen into my little trap because the trap is the six myths. So we're going to have to get them through anyway. So here's the deal. You, basically, the question relates to the aspect of time related to loss and recovery or healing or completion. So let's go here. I want you and everyone listening to imagine this. You go to a park, parking lot, and as you approach your car, you see it has a flat tire. Question, would you pull up a chair and sit down and wait for air to jump back in your tire? <laughs> uh, and, and everyone's laughing out there who's hearing this because that's a silly construct because you realize we come back 100 years later, there would be your skeleton with whatever clothing is left, and that tire would still be flat. Now, we know, Daniel, that one of two things, or maybe a third, but two major things could happen. You realize immediately why you have a cell phone, and you call the auto club and say, hey, folks, come on down here. i got a flat tire. i got to get the kids to school. Or you dig out the jack and the spare tire, and you change the tire, okay, and you get the car back on the road. Either way, an action has to happen before that car gets back on the road. Parallel is this, a broken heart caused by a death, a divorce, or any other loss. Require, well, time won't heal your broken heart any more than it would fix the flat tire, which means action has to be taken to get your heart back on the road. Otherwise, right. you're riding around on what I call the rims of your heart, which is a horrible image. You've got no tire left. You've got no rubber. You're riding around screeching on the rims, and that's what it feels like to a griever. And so you must take action. The problem is if you were told not to feel bad in the first place and then you were told time heals all wounds, which it can't, now you're trapped. And then you keep thinking, okay, it's been six months or it's been a year. I should be over it by now, by now implying that time would have healed it. But would by now fix your tire? No, you got to go do something. And the key to everything, you mentioned the simple title of our book in the opening, The Grief Recovery Handbook. The next most important language is the subtitle, which is the action program for moving beyond death, divorce, and other losses, including loss of career, loss of health, and loss of faith. You know, we can talk all about that later, but the key here is action. You cannot heal within time if you don't take actions within time. Time is actually the least important part of the equation. And the truth is, recovery can begin immediately upon loss. The closer you are to the loss, Daniel, this is fascinating, the closer you are to it, the more accurate your memory is of the relationship with the person who died or the person you're estranged or divorced from. So rather than waiting to do quote-unquote grief work, the trick is to do it right away if you know what to do. The same as you would change your tire right away. You're just going to sit there for months. Mm -hmm. You're going to do something. So we've got to take time out of the equation and put this idea recovery happens within time, but not as a result of time, as a result of action. Then when you know what to do, recovery can happen very, very quickly. So the kind of answer to the second part of your question is recovery is possible when actions are taken, and it happens very quickly because it's not an intellectual thing. It's an emotional thing. And the general language to explain what it is before we get into how to do it 
Here's what, what we're trying to do. We help people discover and complete what was left emotionally unfinished by the death, the divorce, or any other loss. So it's the discovery and completion of unfinished business. The truth is John and I and the Grief Recovery Institute are not in the grief business. We're in the recovery or completion arena. We help people discover and complete unfinished things rather than help them grieve. They don't really need our help grieving any more than they need our help being happy. They need to know what to do about it, and that's where we get in. Mm -hmm. So talk about what it is that the Grief Recovery Handbook and what you do at the Grief Recovery Institute that distinguishes you guys apart, you know, your actions of grief recovery from things such as typical therapy or self-examination and the like? Absolutely. Great question. Here's the deal. We never need to analyze or understand or categorize or 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 put a, put a, a pathological condition on grief because we know grief is the normal and natural reaction to loss. We also know that when any relationship ends due to death, one of the people dies, we know six things. There are always things we wish had happened different, better, or more. There's three words. And another three, all the unrealized hopes, dreams, and expectations about the future. And the difference between grief recovery and therapy and almost anything else is that we're not looking to figure out why your dad did this or why your wife did this or why or who or what. What we're after is your emotional reaction to it that's tied into all the things I wish that I had said or done differently, better, or more, all the things I wish you had said or done differently. Because the emotion is tied into those things. If you and I are best pals or brothers and you've hurt my feelings, and I have never forgiven you, and you die, or we never got to talk about it, and you die, or I owe you an apology, and you die, I am left with some unfinished, undelivered communications. So, and, and instead of trying to figure out, well, why did, why did Daniel do that? Why did he say it? We don't analyze. We don't get into the intellect of it. We don't care about that stuff. We just know that there's an, we're emotionally affected by those things that are left unfinished, by deaths, divorces, estrangements, and so on. And so, and that's the real difference because people tend, not all therapies, tend to talk about figuring things out as if, if I understand what happened, I will feel better. And our answer to that is no, you won't. If you understand what happened, you can write a Ph.D. book on what happened, but that doesn't mean you can put one emotional foot in front of the other. In fact, I know, Daniel, you will have known people who can recite what re amounts to a Ph.D. litany on what happened to them. And they can't live their life effectively, yet they can explain what happened to them. So the knowledge and understanding have limited value, if any. And what we do helps people complete things so they can have a life no matter what happened or why. You know, you, you think about what you're saying, and, and it sounds, just as you said earlier in the program, that it's so easy. So <laughs> instead of intellectualizing it, you know, we have this true opportunity to just say, this is how this feels. Now, is this something that's possible to do when a loss has occurred? It's been years, for instance, and for some reason that's causing a block in your life to move forward in any way, shape, or form. Is it possible to heal from something like that? Absolutely. And, and I probably am as good a test case in point of that as anyone I know. When I arrived here at the Grief Recovery Institute 22 years ago, I arrived here on the heels of my second divorce and a bankruptcy for a half a million dollars. Now, half a million dollars is a lot of money, and it was then too, but ex it was kind of relatively speaking a lot more all those years ago. Now, it would you know, the equivalent would be higher. But that isn't the point. The point is those two events, the second divorce and bankruptcy, brought me to my knees. I felt like the failure of the planet, the failure of the universe. And it didn't matter. By the way, people said, you know, Russell, don't feel bad. They always start with don't feel bad. Don't feel bad. Did you know that Walt Disney went bankrupt seven times before he made, made, made it big? And I said, no, I didn't know. No, I don't care. Why are you telling me not to feel bad? I feel awful. It is not about Walt Disney. It's about me. It's about me feeling like a failure. And hearing about him doesn't help any more than saying on the divorce or don't feel bad. You know, the average in California is two and a half divorces, and you've only got two. You know, you're not even there yet, mister, and all that silly stuff. <laughs> but but the, the point is, when at the first Grief recovery seminar I was in with John W. James, who's now my partner as the leader. He helped me understand something. And I'm going to say something. Um, 
I, I had perceived my child to be the Spanish Inquisition and my father as the Inquisitor General. I had a horrible, horrible childhood with my father, uh -huh. who, although he never physically hurt me, talked to me like I was a criminal. I mean, he treated me horribly. He had this terrible, sarcastic, belittling voice. And he would literally, I was five, he would say things to me like, you'll never amount to anything, you're stupid. Now, can you imagine the impact of that kind of language and tone on a little child, boy or girl, I happen to be a boy, and from his own father who's supposed to love him, help him, and nurture him. Mm -hmm. And so it crippled me. And so when I got in the first seminar, rather than working on the divorce or the bankruptcy, John helped me realize that probably the biggest loss event in my life was not either of my divorces, although they were huge. It was my relationship with my father, who was still living. In fact, my dad just died two and a half, three years ago at age 93. Uh, I, I was... John helped me get emotionally complete with my father, and in the process, I've been able to redevelop all my habits, the habits that were killing me, all those things that you were just alluding to in your question. Right. Something that happened essentially 40 years before I got here or started then. And, you know, you know, by the time I left for college, I wasn't with my father, anymore, but I dragged him everywhere, metaphorically, in how I chose my spouses and how I behaved, how I reacted, my defensiveness. So the habits I developed in reaction to my dad as a five-year-old, seven-year-old, nine-year-old, and so on, I brought into my adult life and my marriages. And what happened? I got two divorces as a result because my poor wives could not understand my behavior, my reactivity, my defensiveness, and everything. Now, therapy couldn't help that. All it can make me understand is that it happened. Grief recovery helped me get emotionally complete with my dad so that I could finally do something different. I am now in a 22-year marriage relationship with my spouse, Alice. Um, you know, and assuming our health stays, I have an, a positive anticipation that we'll get a 20 or 30 more, whatever many years we can both stay alive and healthy. I feel incredible about myself. And I'll, I'll tell you this, Daniel. 22 years ago when I arrived at this organization, I was so defeated that I would have traded my existence with anyone on the planet. And that's mm -hmm. not an exaggeration. Today, I wouldn't trade with anybody. I am finally comfortable in my skin. And it was the skin that had been damaged, the, you, know, the, you know, metaphorically speaking, by my dad and how he was and how I reacted to him. So even though it had happened a long time ago, and now it's, we're talking 60 years ago, I'm 66 now, the changes in me exponentially, positively, day to day, getting better all the time, are magnificent. So even though it happened a long time ago when I first started working on it, the benefits are there. Now, it's easier to work on it the closer you are to it because the memories are more accurate. Mm -hmm. But it, we have no limit. We can help people no matter when it was. And that there are no exceptions to that uh, that I've ever met, especially if anyone's asking for help. If they don't ask for help, it's a different deal. But anyone who asks for help, there are even people come to our trainings and seminars who say, well, I, don't, I can't remember much. But with the few proper questions, it all comes back to them. It's actually very easy. Again, we have this great approach, not through the head, through the heart. So with a little stimulus. Now, the other thing that's interesting, when people come to our seminars and trainings, guess who goes first in telling the truth about themselves? Who do you imagine that might be? Well, that'd be the person that's probably there to recover from their grief, I would guess. No, it would be the leader who is me teaching them. I go first. And one of the favorite lines that John and I ever wrote in a book was in our second book, When Children Grieve. And it was a question, basically asking parents of grieving children this question. Would you take scuba diving lessons from someone who has never scuba dived? Would you? <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. And I know everyone listening went just like, oh, no way. I ain't going to water with you, mister. You've never been in. So grief recovery means the leader goes first to show that it's safe. And right. in the grief recovery handbook, who goes first? John does and I do. We show the people what to do. So by the time they do the thing we ask them to do in the book or in our seminars, they've already done it kind of metaphorically by reading about us doing it. So it makes it safe for them to do it. We also, when we teach parents on guiding their children, you tell the truth first. Instead of trying to get the truth from your child, the best way to ever find out what's true for anyone else, adult or child, is you go first, and then they will jump in. Okay. So now how would somebody do that? How would they go first? Right. Well, in terms of grief recovery, and, you know, since you've read the book or scanned it, you know, I mean, last time when you talked to John, you may have looked through it or read the whole thing. 
the first set of actions after dismissing all the myths, the six myths, and getting them out of the way, because let's face it, if you think you shouldn't feel bad or that time's going to heal you, then I can't help you. If you think you should be strong instead of being human, I can't help you. But, but once you get past the myths and wrong ideas, and the first thing we have people do is take a very, very close look at the losses they've had throughout their life, going back to their earliest losses, which might be, you know, losing their baby blankie, not, you know, having it taken away, having a pet die, a hamster or something when they were a kid, usually an early loss as a grandparent dying, which is typical first death loss of a human for children. Uh, problems in, you know, with school, with teachers, problems adapting to life, uh, health issues, uh, all the losses that happen, we have to look at all of them because that's where we learn the incorrect ideas. And again, this is not rocket science. If it was rocket science, John and I couldn't do it because we aren't scientists. We're just guys who have learned a system that helps people discover and complete stuff. The first discovery is what loss have I had and what did I, what do I, what did I learn about dealing with my own emotions? What do I believe? What do I know? What happened to me? What was told to me when my grandma died? When my grandma died, I was told you have to be strong and you have to be strong for your brother. So my only idea when I was 14 when my grandma died was I had to be strong for my four-year-old brother. Now, uh, the question is how can I be strong for someone else? If I lift weights, who's going to get muscles, me or you, Daniel? Right. I mean, it doesn't. <laughs> some of it makes no sense. And so that's why we give people a choice. You can be strong or you can be human. Pick one. We watch people adults destroy their children by acting strong which means showing no feeling and then trying to get their child to tell the truth but the child won't because the parent won't right <laughs> we call it monkey see monkey do right and that's the first chapter of our when children grieve book but back to the the topic of recovery that we're on first action of recovery is looking at what losses you've had to see what you know about it, what you've done, what hasn't worked for you, and so on, to dismiss that so we can put recovery in its place, which, again, is actually very easy when you get the wrong stuff out of the way. The next major action is then to choose which loss to work on first. And you and I have referenced that today when I said when I arrived here 22 years ago, my devastation was that second divorce and bankruptcy. Yet my partner, John, realized that when I referred to my dad as Hitler and, 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 and my life was the Spanish Inquisition, that he knew, I mean, he didn't take rocket science to figure out that I had a huge problem in my relationship with my father that was painting everything I did. And so he helped me get complete with my father. One of the side benefits was I wound up getting 18 spectacular years with my dad, the same guy who did mistreat me, however he did it when I was a kid. I got 18 glorious years with him, and I feel incredibly lucky. Uh, for some people, they may or may not want that if they have a living parent. If we can just get them to neutral where their memory isn't destroying them, that's virtuous. But for me, I got the extra bonus. Uh, you know, my dad wasn't a bad guy. He was a bad father to boys. I have myself and my younger brother, who's 10 years younger than me, we were both crushed by our father. On the other hand, our sisters, who are twins, they're two years, 10 months younger, they're identical twins, younger than me. They think our daddy walked on water because he was of that age bracket of men who thought you had to treat boys differently than girls. He, he was trying to be tough with us to toughen us up for something, whereas the girls could be the little princesses. So, right. so and, and that's not uncommon, and I'm sure there are a lot of people listening and go, oh, wow, boy, they can relate to that from their own lives somehow, you know, what they've seen. At any rate, well, I, I had to get complete with my father so that my present would work out better. Otherwise, and, and so I, I got to graph my relationship with my father, the good, the bad, and the ugly. But this is a distinction now. You and I have talked a little bit about the difference from therapy. I want to add another thing in here. A lot of people listening will know a little bit about 12-step programs like AA and Al-Anon and OA and those things. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a distinction between grief recovery and those programs because grief is not a disease, whereas technically, you know, most people believe this these days, alcoholism is a disease and any connection to that is disease related. But grief's not a disease. It's a normal and natural reaction to loss. So the kind of inventory they do in AA and other programs, which is valuable for not drinking, is not valuable for grief recovery. Here we have a uh, capacity to not only look at 
what we did, but what the other person did. This way, case, we kind of let people take other people's inventory and say, this is what I did, but this is what my dad did. This is the whole picture, the good, bad, ugly, the way I see it, so that I can apologize for certain things I may have done. I can forgive for things my dad for what he has done, and I can make significant statements about what he did to me that affected me, positive or negative. And so I get to do a fully rounded picture and let me let me do something really interesting here. Um, do you remember the first time you ever heard your own voice on a tape recorder? Right. Who I was do. it? It's not you, is it? You, it doesn't sound like you to you. <laughs> no, for anybody. Not until you do radio for years and you start getting used to yourself. And, well, you, you just read, yeah, me too. I've done a thousand interviews and I've heard myself. I've been, you know, I was. I'm by the way, I'm the grief expert on CNN. I was on after 9/11. I was uh-huh. on after the lady drowned all her children. I was on recently on CNN after the Michael Jackson thing about the children, and and I've seen and heard myself a thousand times. But now I recognize. It's still not me, but at least I recognize. It. Right. Okay. Now. The point of that, and is not to be silly, but is to, to suggest something else. If I say to you, Daniel, tell me about you, it will go through the filter of how you see you and will have whatever natural distortions there are in your own ability to look at yourself. Okay? Right. You won't see yourself. Now, if your spouse is sitting there, she's going to say, excuse me, honey, on what planet do you think you're like that? Because she won't see them. Exa- and at some level, she would be more accurate about you than you could be. And this is one of the primary distinctions between grief recovery and therapy and 12-step programs is that by saying, let's look at your relation to someone, what you think you did and what they did. And when you do all the major people in your life, what you realize is you're the common denominator in all of them. Finally, you get a clearer picture of your part of what you are and what you aren't. And so that's another reason that it's so effective and why it's so different, because we're not taking that myopic view of just you looking at you about you, which is too narrow a window. So it gives a broader, more accurate picture of what is true when you look at these relationships with people living or dead. And so then the third part of this little triumvirate, the loss histograph and the relationship graph, is to put the undelivered and uncommunicated things into three categories. Uh, one is apologies, which is a statement of regret. Anything I did or didn't do that may have hurt you, an act of omission or commission. The next thing, and this is the most difficult of all the categories we deal in, is forgiveness. And we teach forgiveness different than anybody on planet Earth, and we think more effectively. But we teach it so that you have to forgive people for anything they did or didn't do that hurt you, because if you hold on to the resentment, You keep hurting yourself, which is what I was doing with my father. And even if the other person has died, you can continue to harm yourself with your memory of what they did to you. Russell, just for a quick second, when you say what you're saying right here, this is really interesting. Because people who tend to resent hold grudges against somebody who has done something to harm them actually believe they're punishing that person. Isn't that interesting? When, in fact, the person probably is thinking a lot less about you than you think they are. Yeah, they're in Philadelphia having a great day, and you're over here in Portland, or wherever they're going. They're going then, or they're, and, and you've got to go this way. If they're, if they're not living, how can you hurt a person who's no longer alive? Right. And the famous line, I'm sure you know this, is the famous one. It's like, holding on to a resentment is like me drinking poison and expecting you to have a stomachache. I mean, <laughs> Just, Never heard that, but that's pretty much what it is, though. <laughs> yeah, well, well, I have a friend from Texas, and when I, he was in my seminary, he said he had a, his grandpappy used to say in Texas, "Son, resentment's like a poison. Now think of the container it is sitting in. <laughs> so it's eating up your tummy. And what happens is, if I don't forgive you for what you did, then my memory keeps hurting me and me and me. And again, if you've died, and we've got to assume that I can't hurt a dead person, but I keep hurting. And worse, what if I have this fear and resentment based on something you did to me, and you were my father, my brother, my pastor, whatever it is, doesn't matter. And then now I'm married, or I'm in some other relationships, and I'm afraid I'm going to get hurt again based on me not having forgiven you. So I will sabotage or harm my current relationships of all kinds, romantic and otherwise, based on the fear of, of based on not being complete with other stuff. That's what we call, you know, where you're carrying baggage forward. And it's a demolition derby. It, it, it affects everything. There's no limits to it. 
In fact, in our third book, Moving On, which is our relationship book, we address that. How we have there's a, the 50% divorce rate is based to a great part on my fear based on me being incomplete with prior relationships and not wanting to get hurt again. So I will hold other people away so I don't get hurt. And by holding them away, I sabotage the connection that would make the, the intimate relationship. I mean, it's that simple. So, Russell, so it was interesting because I wanted to bring this particular question up earlier in the program that if a person doesn't grieve properly, okay, is it fair to say that it's because of a lack of grieving and recovery that we begin to build fears that create filters on how we see and experience the world, and those are the reasons that keep us from having perhaps the life that we truly want. Absolutely. Exclamation, exclamation. I wouldn't change a word of what you just said. That was That is so perfect. different from the self help realm that you see out there that yes. says follows these secrets, follow these steps, success is guaranteed, but yet people still follow and have the fears, the filters, and that's what holds them back simply in grief recovery. Whatever that is, on any level can be the thing that removes those fears and filters and giving you the courage to be able to step in and say, I demand to have this in my life. Is that what happens? Absolutely. And let, let, let me just, I'm going to piggyback on that because I don't want to improve on because everything you said was perfect. What, what it is this, grieving people, and let's include most everybody who's carrying anything from the past, okay, just without labeling everybody. What grieving people do is lack a safe place and better information and actions. It's three things. The three things we provide is a safe safe environment, better information, and actions to take. And you got to have all three. Right. Okay. There has to be a non-judgmental uh, leader and listener and group, or however you do it, whether you work one on one or in a group. There has to be better information. In other words, you got to get rid of those myths. Again, if you think time's going to heal you, I can't help you. If you think you shouldn't feel bad in the first place, can't help you. If you think you got to be strong, sorry, but big girls don't cry. Sorry about exactly. that. Exactly. <laughs> big girls, not big boys. We, us guys got a bad rap. We're the emotional ones. I'm telling you right now. And then you need to know what actions to take. So it's you know like changing the tire. You got to know what to do. And the tragedy is that. A three-year-old knows perfectly how to deal with grief and loss. A four-year-old has already had it stripped away to a certain degree when they're told, you know, don't feel bad here of a cookie. And mm-hmm. so we have to kind of rebuild everything from the ground up because it gets taken away from us. Right. And again, that's also part of why it's relatively easy uh, because when we can help people see what was stripped away, what we're giving back is a safety to do something they already know how to do. They just haven't felt free to do it for many, many years. I can tell you, it's just, it's just amazing to think about, you know, everything that you're talking about here because it seems so contrary to the common messages that we hear out there about what success is, what failure is, how to improve, how to have courage, how to face your fear. Basically, you know, one of the big ones that seems to be out there <clears throat> that you hear quite a bit is moving out of your comfort zone. Yes. There's a big one right there, and I'm sure that you probably deal with that in your Grief Recovery Institute. Oh, how did you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, it just it, there's your common sense. It just glares at you to go, you can't believe it's just this simple. Right. And so then what do we do? What we want to do, what we do, the first thing was change the language from comfort zone, because it isn't comfort. The key word is familiar. Mm -hmm. And in a crisis, we go back to old, familiar beliefs and ideas. They're not comfortable. And here's what you got to understand. You take a woman who is battered. She is actually physically battered. She goes to a battered woman's shelter. And then she says, well, I'm going back now. And they say, don't, honey. He'll beat you again. She says, no, it'll be different this time. The answer is yes. He'll 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 hit your right eye instead of your left eye. And I don't mean to be glib here because I'm horrible. Right. Now, the question is, why would a woman or man, but it happens more to women, why would they go back where they're physically beaten? Is it comfortable? Is it a comfort zone? No, but it's familiar. It's how they identify themselves. They identify themselves with how they're treated. Now, what is one of the closest things to absolute is a woman who is abused in a in a marital relationship, almost without exception, there are a few, was abused as a child at some level. So what she's going for is familiar, not comfortable. 
And the, the familiar is what we do. Remember I said the five-year-old is taught, don't feel bad here, have a cookie. So every time they feel bad, they reach for a substance. That's familiar. And the illusion even there is comfort food, but it isn't. It's familiar. It's what I do. And one of the bondages we want to help people break is the bondage to the illusion of comfort that's tied into familiar. In a crisis, we go back to old beliefs is what we do because our oldest beliefs are the ones we got when we were youngest. And no matter how many self-help books you have, no matter how many great radio shows you listen to or what you watch or do, in a crisis, you will or leap backwards over all the new stuff you've ever learned and go to the old habits that are tied to mom and dad and other relationships like that. And, and by the way, along that line, you, you hear the famous line, you marry your mother or your father. Right. That's really not quite true. It's what you marry is what you're familiar with. And so it may not be exactly mom or dad. It may be a combo of it. It might be the opposite than you think. But it's about going to what you know because then you know how to behave. And the biggest problem with grieving people is helping them break their identity or relationship to the pain because that's where the familiarity is. That's the trap. So you were so right to know that that's a huge issue for us. I mean, people come and ask us for help, pay us a lot of money, and then fight the help. And you go... Well, why'd you ask for help? <laughs> right. You can't say that. But what happens is their brain wants them to do what it always did. It's like an alcoholic still wants to think that alcohol is the solution when it's the problem for them. Right. So it's mm. it's tricky. I mean, we can make it accessible and doable. And we're the, I think we're the best in the world at doing this. We have a wide range of understanding of this. And always of knowledge of bringing it back to the simplest thing from head to heart and getting to that unfinished thing. But we know the battle we're up against is the familiarity. And the older you are, the more entrenched you are in your habits that are familiar, which is why it's why people you see people for years and years like hamsters on a wheel trying to change and not changing. The best news about grief recovery is that makes change possible. And here's a really sweet thing, and the therapists out there have learned to love us. Therapy works better after grief recovery. So do 12-step programs. So do religious and spiritual programs. So we're very proud, John and I are, of helping people break the bondage of their past so they can have a better present. Because that's the whole point anyway. Right, exactly. And I think that's what everybody dreams of. I mean, for any listener out there, for instance, and I dare say this, that says, you know, I'd like to win the lottery. You're telling everybody that you want your life to be different, but you don't know why most of the time. So you think money is going to be one of those things that will transform you, when in fact <laughs> it's just going to amplify where you're at already. Right, it's and just I got like I, I got a fa- that. I got a fa- one that's really funny, and I love this. <laughs> and it was a joke by Bill Cosby, and he was talking about the usage of cocaine. And he says, why would I use uh, cocaine? And, and so the guy simply says to him, because it enhances your personality. He says, well, what if you're an asshole? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and now, now here's the interesting thing. The, the, you, everybody would recognize that bankruptcy would be a grief issue. Sure. Okay, everybody, I went bankrupt. That's a grief issue. Now, how many people listening realize that probably one of the most universal Grief issues in the world, and the most diabolical is winning a major lottery. I don't know if you've ever read that the winners of major lotteries all around the world, 90% of them lose all the money within three years, Mm -hmm. and they wind up in therapies they didn't need before. Why? Because of our definition of grief, which is grief is the conflicting feelings caused by a change or end in a familiar pattern of behavior. Oh, wow. Wow, that's our. That's why grief is more than death, and more than divorce, and more than moving. It's a. It's forty three different things. Well, like I said, when I was re- reading the grief recovery handbook, you think of the simple little losses that you suffer rather than the catastrophic ones, exactly. and you realize those pile up, and those are worse than the big ones. Are. Well, and the accumulation, unresolved right. grief, is cumulative and cumulatively negative. Now, of the ten percent of people who are not negatively affected and don't lose the money after the, winning the lottery, you know who they are. Who's that? the ones who had money to begin with. So it doesn't represent as big a change. So if you go from lower or middle class, to use old-fashioned terms, you win the major lottery, your identity to yourself is changed and you don't have the capacity for dealing with it. Because what the human condition doesn't deal with well is change. And grief is about change. Change or end and familiar, that's the definition. It's why, it explains why people go back to being abused, because they're familiar with it. We're back to that topic. 
Okay, so winning the lottery can destroy your life and has there are stories there are legion. You go out and do a little research, you see how many people won major land had their lives destroyed by it. It's also something else in our in that in our relationship book, moving on the one I mentioned. Mm-hmm. We wrote a chapter heading that went, "I will be happy be happy when dot dot dot." So I'll be happy when I'm rich, not so fast. I'll be happy when I find the right uh, spouse, not so fast. I'll be happy when I'm skinny. Now, why do people put the weight back on? Because it doesn't make them happy to be skinny. Being happy is what you do is a result of being complete and having making things work. It's not about having stuff. It's not about money. It's not about the right figure. It's not about the right husband or wife. Happiness is an action that you take to how you live your life. And you can't do that unless you get complete with your past. Mm-hmm. So much. It's just, it's really quite amazing to think about something as simple as the grief recovery handbook. I know I had told my wife I demanded, do not let this book out of the house. because <laughs> If you loan it, you won't get it back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You probably won't either, folks. So if you decide, as you should, uh, to get a copy of the grief recovery handbook, it's really, it was just so fascinating in its simplicity. And, you know, it also goes back, are you familiar with the works of uh, Byron Katie, uh, consider it she does what's called the work? I have heard of it, yes. I not, don't know as much as I might yet. Yeah, it's four questions that can change your life. And there was one day a couple of years ago, you know, that I was really frustrated. And my wife says, you know, I want to ask you a couple of questions here. And, and you know, there are no right or wrong answers. And as she did, you know, I was I kept getting to these points where I was saying to myself, wow, I never thought about it that way before. Mm-hmm. And what was quite amazing is that everything that happens in your life is about you. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, so it really got to the truth of it. I see how the Grief Recovery Handbook, you know, was that it was already there all the time. But this was a work that she had created because she found herself at the age of 38 basically down on the floor, curled up into a ball. And then all of a sudden she started asking these questions. And now she's helping people around the world through even a free telephone service that if you need to do the work on whatever troubling thought that you have, this is a way of helping to clear that away by coming from the heart. Grief recovery, I mean, you guys have been doing this stuff for more than 30 years, it seems like. And as you said, talking to more than 100,000 people, you pretty much have heard it all, it sounds like. Yes, there's very few things that surprise me, but, but which also helps me because that way, and this is kind of a little bit of guidance for people who are listening to others, I never get too wrapped up in the storyline someone's telling me. Right. I get wrapped up in the heart line, and I let them know I'm following the heart line, not the storyline. Because the storyline will take you all kinds of places you don't want to go. <laughs> As I never... tell people, they'll say, you know, I'll say, what's wrong? Well, it's a long story. I said, no, it isn't. And yeah. then they actually tell it to me. They go, you know, you're right. <laughs> but, you know, I remember I was saying that before I got on the line with you today, a woman called whose dog died. Uh-huh. And I kept saying, oh, gosh, I imagine your heart's broken. And every time I did that, it would bring her off the story to her heart, which is the place we were talking to. Right. And and, and watched her trying to get herself away from it because it was scary. And I said, look, I know it's scary, but the only thing I want you doing is the only thing your mind, heart, body, and soul want to do. Today's the day and tomorrow and the next day. But the only thing on your plate is the death of your friend. So don't, she said, well, what can I do so I won't feel that? I said, I don't want you. Not. I know it sounds harsh, but it's what you need to do. It's important to feel, because if you were happy, you wouldn't be trying to avoid that feeling, would you? Mm-hmm. Feeling sad is a normal reaction to loss, so we don't want to move people away from something that has a value, it has a meaning. Now, I said you've got to be careful driving a car because it's hard to concentrate and focus when you're grieving, which is a pretty close to a universal truth. But you can't go around it or over it or under it. You've got to go through it. And, but it's easier to go through if you feel safe enough, you have people around you who will listen to you without trying to fix you. Remember, grievers aren't broken. They need to be heard, not fixed. Now, when they want to get to a grief recovery where they need some actions, then we can guide them as to the action. But the truth is, Daniel, the only person who knows the truth about you in the whole world is you. I don't know anything. Mm-hmm. The best I ever have is a swag, S-W-A-G. You ever heard that one? No, I haven't. It's a sophisticated, wild-ass guess. That's a swag. <laughs> 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 and when it comes to grievers, John and I are real clear, we don't want to be guessing, because guessing is dangerous. Mm-hmm. We, so people who help grieving people never guess. I help people by finding out what their truth is. I don't plant things. I harvest them. I help. I hear them better than anyone ever heard them. That's the trick. Hearing the heart line, not the storyline. 
following and, and, and acknowledging how sad or painful or frustrating or happy something sounds. And what happens is they trust me almost immediately. And then they, I, I'll be on the phone with someone that's like, gosh, I've told things to you I never met you that I've never told to anyone before. Right. That's how quickly we create safety. And, and it's really, when people read the Grief Recovery Handbook, because it is first person about John and I, and we go first, people feel safe with us, almost like they were talking to us and over the backyard fence. And, and we write our books in a kind of backyard fence tone. So it, and as you know from looking at it, it, it's not written like heavy academic stuff. Thanks. You know, i got to say, too, Russell, I remember the last time when we covered this, and I might have even shared this story about how conditioned our the world is, I would almost say, and how we respond to people who are grieving. And the story goes uh, real simple, that there was a, a co-worker uh, some years ago, uh, this was back right around 9-11, and uh, she, her boyfriend had just broken up with her, and so I decided to go ahead and give her a nice little gift, you know, just to kind of ease the pain a little bit. And I said, you know, there's one thing i got to tell you, and that is somewhere out there in the world, somebody is having a more awful time than you are. You see, that's that condition response. I could have never imagined that the next day 9-11 would occur. Yeah, I would have to face her again, and she says, you know, you're right. The sad part about that story is how I took her grieving away from her, or at least it seemed like I did, and I didn't mean to do that. Exactly. You know, and so now here was a more significant event, but that doesn't mean that her grieving was less significant. Exactly, and, and you know, the, the in difference between intent and impact, I write about that. I write mm-hmm. articles about Nobody ever intends to hurt a griever, but they say things that aren't helpful. And, of course, John and I would spank you for having done what you did to her. <laughs> well, I was what? already beating myself up okay, after good, the last good. time. I'm I, I <laughs> Again, like I said, point. after that last time that we had you on the program, I started seeing things in a different way in how society, the messages, everything. I'm like, that is wild. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's so subliminal that it's no wonder that we're all walking around sure. robots that don't want to deal with grief at all. Exactly, and that comparison is something we never, never do because we use the idea, you know the line we all learned as kids, I was unhappy about having no shoes until I met the man who had no feet. That's a great little tool for teaching kids something, but it's terrible when it comes to grief because it has set up this idea of comparing one loss to another. Mm-hmm. And the truth is all grief is experienced at 100%. There are no, ex- no exceptions and no comparison. Otherwise, if I have 10 people in the room, last week I had 12 people in my room here, which I can hardly hold for, for a four-day training. And I said, if you take that to its furthest conclusion, there can only be one person in the room, the one with the longest list of losses. Uh, your mother died, mother and father over here, mother, father, brother, sister, and then the person with the longest list of losses gets help. Everyone else has to go because by comparison, they're okay? Right. Well, that's crazy. Yeah. You can't compare death to divorce. You can't even call it compare death to death because, and here's the bottom line for today and, and for our world that John and I live in. Every relationship that has ever happened on planet Earth is unique. There are no exceptions. And, and grief recovery is about helping people discover and complete what was left unfinished in their unique relationship with someone who was important to them, whether they, whether they were a parent, a lover, a, a spouse, a child, a best friend, a workmate. It's about unfinished business in that unique relationship. So we're never looking at any cliches or any comparisons. It's always about that. And that's why it works, because we get to what is true for you about that person or that animal or that job or whatever the thing is that was lost. The Grief Recovery Handbook is the one that you want, definitely, and our guest here on the Beyond 50 radio program, Russell Friedman. Could you go ahead and give a website people can find out more about this? Absolutely. www.grief.net. Pretty easy. Uh, On there, on the site, on the top ribbon, you'll find helpful articles. There's about 100 articles I've written over the years. They can be accessed and downloaded for free, no cost. You can print them. You can send them to people. They're very, very valuable. And something I want to tell you, the Grief Recovery Handbook can be bought there. It can be bought at Amazon, but I want everybody to hear what I'm about to say. John and I have been doing this a long time. We have donated over 5,000 copies of our books to libraries all over the country. If you are listening to us talk today and you think you want or need that book, go to the library and check it out. It doesn't have to cost you a penny. John and I don't do this for money, although we have to pay you know, pay our bills and everything. Sure. <laughs> Bottom line is here, our lives were saved by what we've learned to do and we teach others. If you don't have money, go to the library. I don't care if you go to the bookstore, sit on the floor, and read the first 
part, which is 58 pages. Read that first part, then call me if you want some guidance or help. Now, that costs you nothing to do, so you can't say money here. If people are listening to this and realizing they got some stuff, we want them to get help. We want to give, get it right away. We've donated books to libraries. Go get the help. No excuses. Let's get the help. It's available. Mm -hmm. Because definitely if you don't, re uh, I guess, repair yourself, if you will, for lack of a better word, mm -hmm. from your grief, then you deny the special gifts that you have to help others have a better world for themselves. Perfectly There's stated. no excuse for that. None. None. It's unacceptable. We, you and I will you and I'll go out there and smack them around. With them. <laughs> <laughs> they don't want to mess with us, do they, Daniel? Not at all. Russell Friedman, always a pleasure to have you folks on our program today. I mean, it's always enlightening, and it's certainly profound at the same time. Again, the book is The Grief Recovery Handbook, and our guest today, Russell Friedman. Again, thank you for being on our program today. Thanks, Daniel. You bet. I want to also encourage you listeners out there to visit us at our website at beyond 50 radio.com and also sign up for our free weekly e-newsletter and also visit us at our blog where we archive even this specific show along with uh, a lot of others hot links to get to the resources that you need thank you for tuning in i'm daniel davis this is the beyond 50 radio program and remember live your day past halfway